Hello everybody, this is Pastor Tim Campbell. I'm not sure the day or the time you might be watching this video, uh, but uh, we are going to begin a Bible study. Um, a lot of times, you know, on Sunday morning, we're busy preaching and we're delivering the Word of God, and sometimes it's just a good opportunity, and I think this might be a good opportunity just to set some time aside to actually kind of dive into the Bible. Because uh, a lot of times we just don't get those opportunities where you uh, sometimes start preaching topically, um, or maybe we're uh, preaching um, on, you know, with time constraints, of course. Um, and so I want to just do something over the next uh, some time. Not sure how long. Um, of course, none of us know how long this thing is going to last. Uh, but uh, what we want to do is just start diving into the Word of God. Um, the Word of God is rich. It is powerful. The Word of God is a uh, two-edged sword that cuts both ways. Um, it is used for correction. It is used for growth. It is used for inspiration. Um, the Word of God is a living thing that as believers, um, we don't use a lot of. Uh, we don't use a lot of the Word of God in our own personal lives. We don't... Uh, we don't meditate in a lot of time. Some of us uh, lack the knowledge of the Word of God inside of our lives to be able to, even during these difficult times, to be able to overcome things uh, so that we are able to maintain our spirituality. We are able to maintain that relationship with God. Um, I encourage you, <clears throat> not just with these videos, not just with other people's videos perhaps, but within your own life, begin to take this time and especially with everything that's going on with isolation and all this, let's open up the Word of God together. Let's, as individuals, open up the Word of God in our families' homes and be able to develop children that have a appreciation, a love for the Word of God so that they are able to, with their own personal lives, begin to grow themselves. And you'll be amazed how some of these stories that we read and we look at and maybe we've uh, been to uh, school since we we're itty bitty, uh, Bible school since we we're itty bitty and Sunday schools. And some of us, you know, we were practically seemingly raised in church. And somewhere along the line, because maybe we've been saturated with so much of the word in us, maybe we've allowed the word of God in our own personal lives to begin to kind of grow a little bit cold. Something that we haven't picked up in a while. Something that we haven't jumped into in a little while. Because, well, you know, I know David wins every single time. I know Moses splits the, the Red Sea every single time. But there's still richness in those stories. There's still richness in the words from Paul when he's writing to the early churches, the words of encouragement, words of correction, words of love. There's still so much richness there. The word of Jesus, the life that he is giving, the revelations that he is giving, is something that we cannot neglect in our own personal life. And it's something that too many of us as believers, because of our busyness and our schedules and our running around and our go, 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 go lifestyles that we have de developed, we have allowed the word of God to begin neglected. And we'll say, well, I'll get it on a Sunday morning. Well, let's be real. You're in church for an hour, hour and a half. Some churches may be two hours. Um, <clears throat> how much time is that out of the week? And in those hour, hour and a half, two hours, how much is actually the Word of God going for it as far as in the preaching context? Um, half an hour, maybe some 45 minutes, maybe some an hour. And so you have how many hours in a week that you're neglecting to be able to spend in the Word of God? So I encourage you, as things are slowing down in our lives, and I think that can be healthy for us all, um, as things are slowing down and we have this opportunity now, and I see this as an opportunity for us to jump into the Word of God and allow it to re-breathe on us yet again. Allow it to be fresh. Allow it to be something that inspires us again. Have that amazing wide eye wonder as a child, hearing the very first time when David, a young boy, went against this this giant, not sure how it was going to end, but yet somehow, some way, God overcame this giant in front of him. And I believe today, church, that we have that same opportunity to overcome our giants in our own personal lives. We have that same opportunity to press forward and press on and continue lifting up the name of God through our situations, just as David did in that situation with the giant. We have that same opportunity today to press in press through and overcome. And that's just one story that we've kind of forgotten about, but in a moment in time like this, it's so inspiring. 
But the enemy would love us right now to begin to neglect the very Word of God, to stop getting inspired from it, to allow our understandings of it to continue to grow cold and to continue to grow dull, uh, rather than continuing it to be sharp and something that uh, helps us and drives us and inspires us and continues us moving forward. And so I want to talk about the Word of God. I want to, over the next some time, we're going to jump into a book. Uh, we're going to go through a book, um, you know, not in a quick fashion, and some of these lessons might be a little bit longer than others, but we want to go through the book of Acts, uh, because that's the early church, and the early church uh, went through a lot. Uh, it was not uh, this idea that, hey, let's start a social club and see the social club expand and everybody accept it and everybody celebrate it. Rather, it was uh, this idea that they were starting the early church full of power through an anointing through the Holy Spirit breathing upon it and bringing it into life, but they faced challenges. Every step there was challenges and oppositions to overcome imprisonments and tortures and shipwrecks and um, people not understanding what they were talking about and the message going for, for, uh, out past where Jerusalem was and unto all the known parts of the world in a very short amount of time. And the book of Acts does a very good job for us of covering some of that time and some of the work of the apostles. And so when we jump into the Bible, it's good to remember that there's different types. You know, the, the, the Bible is not just one book um, with one author. The Holy Spirit inspired and breathed upon people to be able to write this uh, without error. But what the Bible is is 66 individual books. And we see that the books are breaking down into many different forms. We have uh, the law. We have history. We have wisdom. We have poetry. We have the gospels. We have the epistles. We have prophecy. And we even have apocalyptic literature. And so we have different ways of interpreting that when we dive into it. We look at something like the book of Psalms. And we read it not saying everything in here is literal. Rather, we look at it and say, here's a lot of poet poetry. And poetry inspires, and poetry paints a beautiful picture, and poetry can give us insights in a very artistic way to be able to say, you know, God is beautiful, and what he does is amazing. And there's a times in, in, in Psalms where you see people even venting. Uh, we see David oftentimes sitting there and venting to God about the things in his life and, and the situations that he's in and feeling like, God, if you don't do something, but yet he always reminds himself through his poetry that God is doing something and God is able to deliver him. We see the Gospels. We see the accounts of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John uh, together. We see them with their accounts of Jesus and we see the life of Jesus. The epistles, we see the letters to the church. Uh, how uh, Paul and, would write, and James and Peter, they would write these uh, epistles to the church, of these letters, essentially, to the church of encouragement, of love, some of correction. Uh, and all of these letters that we have, and uh, Paul being the one that would write two-thirds of the New Testament, uh, we see that there's a lot of love inside of these letters. Uh, there's a lot of theological truths that we hold on to today and are still uh, understanding uh, that they would write about. We see the, the wisdom books. Uh, Proverbs is a great example of that, of uh, showing wisdom uh, and how wisdom is. Uh, we see um, you know, the, the prophecy books, the major prophets, the minor prophets, prophesying of Jesus, prophesying of the one that would come throughout the Bible. And of course, we see the book of Revelations with the end times. Um, and we see, we see the history books, um, you know, First Kings, Second Kings, Judges, Samuel, and we see the books of the law in there as well. Uh, parts of Genesis has some of the law in it. Exodus has some of the law in it. Leviticus is full of law. Uh, Numbers is full of law as well. And so we see all of these books, different books broken into different categories, but 66 books that make up the beautiful Word of God that He has given to us so that we can feel inspired, that we can gain hope, and that we can get an understanding of who He is that he is God in good times and difficult times and amazing times, times that are feeling like we're a little isolated, maybe from the body of Christ, maybe from one another, but we're never isolated from God because we have the word of God with us at all times. And so uh, today, again, I want to jump into the book of Acts. Um, 
Uh, because but the book of Acts, again, it's a, an introduction to the early church. It's the things that uh, went on right after and uh, Jesus went to heaven. Um, and it's the account of the apostles. Now, my main uh, study guide I'm going to be getting this is through F.F. F. Bruce. Um, it is his, uh, the book of Acts uh, that he wrote uh, quite some time ago. He was a major um, um, writer um, and professor um, over at Oxford um, School over in England. And uh, just a, an amazing, great thinker and a gift to the body of Christ while he was alive. Um, and so we're going to be jumping into this and uh, jumping into uh, the things that he talked about in, in his commentary as well as other commentaries I've read along the way. And again, the book of Acts is a beautiful book to be able to see the accounts of the early church. And so I encourage you over these this next some time just to uh, get a, uh, a pen out, get some paper out, uh, get your Bible out, um, and uh, begin to take notes. Uh, begin to uh, jump into this thing together um, as we dive into this. So let us pray. Father, we thank you for this opportunity, Lord. We thank you for this opportunity to be able to come together, Father as uh, individuals, as uh, a church. Father, wherever they are at, Lord, and however they are listening to this, Lord, I pray that the Word of God inspires them where they're at, Father. Lord, we pray for comfort for the ones that need comfort in their lives at this time, Father. Lord, we pray for healing for the ones that need healing at this time in their lives, Lord. Father, I thank you for what you're doing in all of our individual lives, Father. I thank you for what you're doing in the corporate church world as well, Father, the big C, Father. Lord, because you, the Word of God says, and you declare it, and you allow us to be inspired by it, that the gates of hell shall not prevail against your church, Father. And so, Lord, these times might be trying, and these times might be hard, Lord, but we understand as believers that there is nothing the enemy can throw at us that will ever destroy us, Father. We thank you for what you're doing. Continue to be with us today. And open up our hearts and open our minds to receive the word of God that you would have us to receive today. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. So let us jump in this together. Uh, excuse me, I'll be taking sips of my coffee um, as we go through this as well. Uh, but um, the uh, book of uh, Acts, and we'll begin Acts chapter 1. And before we jump into the Acts chapter 1, it's important to know a few things. Whenever you jump into a, bi uh, a book of the Bible, it's a good idea to kind of know a few, uh, what is the historical context, what's going on, who wrote it, uh, maybe if we have any account of them, that's helpful as well. And uh, so, you know, first and foremost, uh, we know that the book of Acts was written by Luke, the same person that would write uh, the gospel according to Luke. Um, we know that he was a doctor. Uh, we know that uh, he was a uh, medical doctor, and uh, he was a very well-educated person. Uh, he would have been a, a company um, with uh, several people. And that's sometimes what makes Acts kind of tricky in reading, is because you have different perspectives. Uh, we have the first-person account, and we'll see that as we read, because you'll hear I, we, uh, written throughout the book. And then at other points, it's they and them. Uh, they did this. Um, and so you see that all of a sudden he wasn't there, but he was hearing the stories and he was uh, making accounts out of that. Um, the book was actually written to an individual. Uh, we read in Luke chapter 1, uh, verse 1 and 3, and then also in Acts chapter 1, verse uh, 1 and 3 too. Um, and we see this character named Theophilus. Um, we don't know anything about this person. We don't know where he came from. We know he was in Rome. Um, there has been a lot of people over the years that have said this person never existed, that this was just a, a name given uh, for church people in the early church to disguise a letter written to a, a group of people. Most people now have said that that was probably not the case, um, and that Theophilus was a very real person. Now, was this his given name? Uh, we're not sure, because what his name actually means is dear to God, and so maybe he was a real person. Um, and maybe that wasn't his real name, but it was definitely a real person that Luke was writing to. And he was most likely a real Roman citizen. Um, and you read in Luke chapter 1, and he says, Many have undertaken to draw up an account of the things that have been fulfilled among us, just as they were handed down to us by those from the first were eyewitnesses and servants of the word. With this in mind, 
Since I myself have carefully investigated everything from the beginning, I too decide to write an orderly account for you, most excellent Theophilus. And so here he is in Luke saying that I'm writing all of this, the, the gospel account to Luke, of Luke, for one person. Isn't that amazing that 2,000 years later, we would still be gleaming over Luke's accounts that he heard from other people, that he got from credible sources, and the things that he wrote down together to compose the entire book of Luke. Now, you have to think to yourself, uh, you know, I can sit down and, you know, I've had a lot of classes and I just wrapped up one class and my last paper was a 12-page paper. Uh, no, it was actually 15 to 16 pages, sorry. Um, and so I sat down and wrote that in about a day and a half. Uh, with a lot of breaks in between, wasn't the most difficult undertaking that I've ever taken in my life. I have a computer. I'm not the fastest typer. I'm not the slowest typer. But you would have to think, back then, writing was much different. They did not have computers. They didn't have ink pens, as we would call an ink pen. They didn't have pencils. They didn't have those things. And paper was very expensive. The instruments to be able to sit down and write something was not cheap at all. And so the first thing that that tells me as a believer is that there's going to be an expense that we have to choose to pay for the gospel. To be able to get the gospel out, there is an expense that all of us are going to have to pay. It is not free to be able to give the gospel out. There's an expense. It's a cost. It comes as a very real cost. And it comes as a very real ministry as well. And we don't know the things that we're investing in as far as kingdom, what they're going to do in the long run. We know that we have to be faithful to what God's called us to do. And if it comes as a financial cost, then we have to be willing to pay that financial cost. If it comes as a time, talent cost, then we have to be willing to pay the time to be able to willing to pay the talent. Luke was said that he was willing, essentially, when he's writing all of this, when I look at this, that he was willing to pay the talent cost because he was a very talented writer. He was willing to pay the time cost because it would have taken a long time to sit there and write one book. And it would have cost him a lot of money to sit there and write an entire book. But he was willing to pay all three of those costs. And we thank God that he was because still today, 2,000 years later, we have the hope, we have the account, we have the extraordinary life of Jesus. We have the extraordinary works of the early church, all because he was willing to do that. What are you willing to invest? What are you willing to do? Maybe it's your own personal family. Maybe it's your own personal life. Maybe the Holy Spirit has been convicting you about uh, going to Bible college. I don't know. Or maybe going to college to start a business. I don't know. Ministry is just not... Uh, Bible college and then go find a church to be a pastor of, or an evangelist or a prophet. You know, ministry is everywhere around us at all times. So maybe God is calling you to start a business. Maybe God is calling you to do something, but up front is going to be an expense. And it's going to be expense of your time, naturally. It's going to be expense of your, your talents, and it's going to be an expense of your resources. We will never be able to get to our future unless we're able, we're willing to pay the expense now, up front because it all comes as a cost. And, but thank God, again, Luke was willing to pay the price uh, for that. And we read Acts chapter 1. Again, um, we read Acts chapter 1, verse 1, uh, beginning, In my former book, Theophilus, I wrote about all that Jesus began to do and to teach. And so he's reminding him, hey, everything I wrote, remember that whole book that I wrote to you? Of course, he wouldn't have forgotten about it. Um, it would have come as, as a great cost. It would have come as something he would have cherished. He said, but in my former book, which is the book of Luke, or the gospel according to Luke, uh, Theophilus, I write about all that Jesus began to do and to teach. And he says, I, I didn't hold anything back to you. I wrote about all the things that Jesus uh, began to do and to teach. So he said, I never held anything back from you. You know, it's not our job to hold the gospel back. It's not our job to hold back the good stuff. It's not our, heart, our job to hold back the stuff we have to wrestle with. Um, and I like that Luke would remind Theophilus of that, that, hey, I didn't hold anything back. I wrote it all to you. I'll let you wrestle with it. Uh, in our society, we don't like wrestling with things. We want it delivered uh, with Google speed and Google accuracy, hopefully. Uh, and we don't want to have to wrestle with it. We want it to be spoon-fed to us. But there are certain things in our life that we are going to have to wrestle with. 
Uh, and there's biblical truths out there that we need to learn to wrestle with. And it's a healthy wrestle. And it's a, it's a, it's a wrestling, uh, a spiritual awakening that can happen inside of us as we begin to wrestle with these things. And so I like that he, he starts off with that. And he reminds the obelisk and us as the readers today that he already had written one book. And so then why would you write this next book? You know, why would you write this thing? You've already expended and ex experienced, uh, expressed a lot um, in this. And we see in the later part of Acts uh, something insightful. Uh, because what we get at the very end of Acts, and uh, spoiler alert, um, at the end of Acts we see that Paul is there in Rome preaching the gospel. A beautiful picture of Paul. We would know that later Paul would be offered up in a, um, uh, as a martyr in Nero's circus. Uh, but here is, here is him leaving us with Paul. Now we know Theophilus was most likely a Roman citizen. And so what would Theophilus' biggest question be at this time? Hearing, having this book of, okay, I got the account of Jesus and his works. But really, when you think about the historical nature of Jerusalem and the Jews at that time, they were considered a very kind of backwater place. But all of a sudden, here's this movement that is taking over the world from Jerusalem, now on the streets of Rome, taking Rome by storm. And so I think one of his big questions was, how did this all happen? How did this get from Jerusalem to the, one of the most influential and biggest superpowers that the world had ever known, especially up to that time? How did that take place? And so now what Luke is doing out of love to answer, I believe, that very real question that Theopolis and many other uh, perhaps new believers would have had at that time. How did this all come here? Because that's amazing. And that blows my mind. Um, I think a lot of people would have just been like, wow, Jesus is amazing. And he, he teaches of love and acceptance. And he talks about forgiveness. And you know, we have all these other gods that say that I have to work and I have to do this and I have to do that. But here's God saying, no, I've done all the work for you. That's a awesome. But how did it get here? And so one of the big things that Luke is in doing with this book is saying, this is how it came to you. This is how this happened. That it came to you today in your hands and so we have to understand that part of that amazing journey of this is the amazing journey of acts now uh, we we read in uh most uh, of your translations and i'll be reading out of the new king new king james version uh for most of this um but um you know a lot of it is uh the book of acts or the acts of the apostles some uh theologians have said it should probably be named some of the acts by a few of the apostles because there was a whole early church working away that we will never know. We'll never know their names. We'll never know their stories. We'll never know their sacrifices. Uh, but there was an entire church world that was moving ahead with the gospel of Jesus Christ, be, despite major persecutions. So another thing to jump into before, or rather get into before we jump into uh, the book of Acts is a little bit more backstory. Um, some things that uh, we kind of forget about sometimes when we read um, the, uh, the book of Acts. Uh, but one of the things that is important to keep in mind is that uh, you have different players within the uh, circles here of the religious order, which, of course, the religious order that we will uh, get involved with mostly will be um, the church in Jerusalem, or rather the synagogues in Jerusalem, and the Pharisees, and the Sadducees, and some of the Zealots. Now, those are very three distinct religious orders within Judaism at that time. You had the Pharisees. Um, and you have to understand a little bit about the Pharisees. The Pharisees uh, were protectors of the law. The Pharisees started off great. They started off so, so good. Several hundred years before Jesus ever walked on the earth, they would start as a order that said, you know what, you're getting in too far out of line. Um, because they would look around, and there were certain people that were looking around and saying, hey, you know what, this isn't right to mix paganism into our practices because that was what was happening and so they came out and said no, no no we need to go back to the law we need to go back to what God has given us and that's the law uh, because that's all they knew at the time they didn't have the new covenant they didn't have mercy grace all of those things uh, they didn't have the blood of Jesus that would cleanse and wash all of our sins but they did have the law and they said no no we're mixing too much inside of our law 
um, rather our practices of paganism. And so we need to get back to that. And they started off so good. They started off so good with those intents of saying, you know, essentially, we need a revival. We need people to come back and fall in love with the, the Yahweh, the, 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 the God with the creator of the heavens and the earth, and not mix all these other things up. But then you fast forward from when it started to when Jesus came on the scene. And unfortunately, just as Paul would talk about later, the law ultimately only kind of kills you because you can't, you only start suffocating under the law. Because nobody can live a fully just life under the law. Uh, because we'll all mess up. We'll all make mistakes. We'll all fall short of the law. Um, and that's why we need Jesus Christ and his mercy and his grace active in our lives. And so you have them. And they believed that God would inter interact with our own personal lives. They believed in angels. They believed in life after death. They believed those things are, are, were very, very real. They be believed in the um, Abrahamic bosom. Um, so to speak, and that was a term that they would use back then quite a bit to say, you know, after you died, you kind of went and rested with Abraham until, you know, whatever happened, happened after that. Um, so they believed in that. And then you had the zealots. Um, there were some of the, the, the apostles and disciples that were zealots. Uh, zealots were uh, pretty rough people. Uh, they believed that Jesus, or the Messiah rather, was coming with a sword, and his one and only single job was to overthrow the Roman government. That was the only thing he was coming for. He was coming back, he was going to set up an amazing kingdom here on earth, and the Messiah was going to kick over the, um, the, the Roman government. And they were always looking for that Messiah, that person that would take that charge. They weren't looking for a Messiah that was going to forgive sins. They weren't looking for a Messiah that was going to do all those things. They were essentially saying, let's go back to David. If we could have a good king like David, then that would be amazing. Um, Judas was a zealot. There was a few other ones that were zealots as well. Uh, there's a lot of talk about Judas and his intentions with what he did with Jesus. And maybe that was him trying to um, push Jesus forward into that conquering king there on earth. Um, that's a lot of speculation. You can figure that one out yourself. Resolve with that one if you want to. Um, and then you had, um, um, you had the Pharisees, the Zealots, and the Sadducees. The Sadducees were interesting uh, because the Sadducees were a very strong religious order of that time. But what they were was this idea that, you know, these are really good laws. These are really good stories. But does God really interact with our, our personal lives? Probably not. But these are really good ways to live by. We should live by them as hard and as fast as we can. Um, and then, you know, just in case he's real, then we've appeased him as well. You know, we hear that thinking all the time as well, even around us today. Um, and so they didn't, some of them didn't even believe in an afterlife. Um, they definitely didn't believe that Jesus or the Lord would um, mix in their own daily lives. And so as we read the book of Acts, you will see these ideas, especially when Paul gets on the scene, because he kind of sometimes plays the crowd uh, with each other and against each other at certain times to uh, help himself actually escape out of a horrific situation. Um, and so those are important things to remember as well as we dive into this. And so let's together go into Acts chapter 1 in a real fashion this time. To Acts chapter 1, verse 1. The former account I made, O Theopolis, of all that Jesus began both to do and to teach, until the day in which he was taken up, after he, through the Holy Spirit, had given commandments to the apostles whom he had chosen, to whom he also presented himself after, alive after his suffering by the infallible proofs, being seen by them during forty days and speaking of the things pertaining to the kingdom of God. And so here he is, and Luke is setting the scene. He's like, you know, Theopolis, this is what we're going to talk about. We're going to talk about the things that happened... Um, after Jesus presented himself, you know, we understand that Jesus died on a cross. Three days later, he rose from the dead. And he presented himself to the apostles. He presented himself to other believers. Up to 500 different uh, believers, it says in the, uh, the Gospels, that he presented himself up to. And for 40 days, he was spending time with them. We see at one time, he's sitting there and he's cooking them fish on the seashore, and he would forgive Peter, and he would uh, restore Peter. Um, we see that. We see that he's eating with his disciples. Um, and this was something that he would have done, um, not because physically he needed to eat, but it was a proof to them at where they are at. 
You know, that's something I love about the Bible and I love about the Lord is that he deals with us where we're at. You know, they were a very superstitious uh, group of people and they're seeing him and some of them might, might end in the back of their minds thinks, this is a ghost. It's a, it, it, that's what this is. This is a ghost that I'm looking at. Um, but Jesus didn't want them to think he was a ghost. He wanted them to know that he was the resur in the resurrected body. Um, and so he would have uh, Thomas, uh, as we know, <coughs> uh, touch his um, um, side and he would touch his, his hands where the, the, the nails would go through. He would eat with them to show them that, hey, ghosts can't do this. And I love that because it just tells me that, you know what? God's going to meet you where you're at. You don't need a, um, and I'm not saying anything about this. I have a, a few degrees myself. You don't need a Bible degree to understand God. You don't need a, a list of accolades in front of your name, behind your name, in the middle of your name um, to understand that God loves you and he cares for you. And maybe that's all you'll get. And maybe that's all, all you'll dive into in your life. As one theologian said, if I could ever understand the enormity of God's love for me, then I feel like I'll have accomplished something. And I think that's a beautiful thing. And I think that's an amazing um, uh, saying. Uh, but... God's there with us. And again, he deals with us where we're at. He's not trying to go over our head, but he's there with us. And if we're dealing with a sin or we're dealing with something in our lives, God's not looking down on us and condemning us. Rather, he's meeting us where we're at and saying, allow me to touch your life. Remember the gentleman that came up to, to, to the Lord and asking, asking for something? And uh, he, uh, the Lord said, if you have faith, and the man's like, I got faith. And then immediately what he would say is, God, help me with my unbelief. Because he's like, I got faith on the outside, but maybe inside of me I'm still dealing with that. And Jesus didn't judge him. Rather, he did what he said he was going to do to the man in, within his life and operated in an amazing way. God deals with what we're at. And I love that. And I love that, that, that God still does that for us, even today. And Jesus would spend 40 days with them, speaking of things pertaining to the kingdom of God. Essentially, uh, there's been a lot of different accounts. Uh, what did Jesus say? What did Jesus talk about? Uh, did he give him more end time revelation? Or did he do this or that? I think if he did a lot of extra curricular teaching, we probably would have had that. I think we would have probably uh, found that maybe a book written, um, the after resurrection teaching or something like that. But we don't have that. Why don't we have that? Because I think what he was doing was reiterating everything he already said. Because most of his messages, most of a lot of his parables, and a lot of his things, he was talking about the kingdom of God. Um, and so we have that. And I think the writers felt like, well, he's already talked to us about that. Now we have the revelation of who he was, really. Uh, we have the revelation of the resurrection. And so we don't need to re go into all the teachings because actually he's already spent a lot of time doing that for us in the word of God, um, in the gospels. And so I don't think that he taught them anything new. Um, I think it was a reiteration of, yeah, now that you all understand who I am, and there's no question anymore. Let's kind of go re-over those things. We have the uh, opportunity now to continue going over the teachings of Christ and the teachings of Christ and the parables and all of those things over and over again. Back then, they wouldn't have had that written form in front of them. So I think he just reiterated a lot of things to them. In verse 4 of chapter 1 of Acts, And being assembled together with them, he commanded them, Jesus, uh, not to depart from Jerusalem, but to wait for the promise of the Father, which... He said, you have heard from me. For John truly baptized with water, but you shall be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. Therefore, when they have come together, they asked him, saying, Lord, will you at this time restore the kingdom of Israel? And they said, it is not for you to know times or seasons which the Father has put in his own authority. But you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you shall be witnesses to me in Jerusalem, and all of Judea, and Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. Amen. And so here they all are. They're all together, as they said, assembled together. They're all kind of around each other. And some said there was around 500. Some said no, it was around the 120. Um, but however many it was, he's, he, they, they didn't want to go away. And he reminded me, he says, hey, you're going to go to Jerusalem, and don't leave Jerusalem until something happens. And the Holy Spirit's going to come upon you. He didn't tell them how it was going to happen. He just said, don't leave until it does happen. Um, you're going to have to wait for it. Um, and that's something in 2020 we don't like doing. 
We don't like waiting for anything. Uh, we want it instantaneously. We want it now. We want it yesterday. We want our Amazon package to be delivered within a few hours. We want our um, our um, Bible to be uh, delivered to us as fast as possible and as most digestible way as possible. We've allowed this microwave mentality of everything to take place in our life where it has to happen now, 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 now. And then Jesus comes along and says, you're going to have to wait. You're just going to have to slow down. <clears throat> because even in their time right now, life moved a lot differently. But boy, just think how much has changed in 40 days. And Jesus was, you know, uh, just risen from a, from from the dead, and just a few days from that before that he was hi, uh, hanging on a cross, and just a few days before that he was in an upper room, and so a lot is taking place in their lives. A lot of revelations are beginning to spark, and a lot of aha moments, and that's what they were talking about. And oh, I remember when the prophets in the old, you know, what we would consider the Old Testament. I remember when this prophet was talking about the Messiah would do this, and ah, I see those things now. And then because he reminds us that John truly baptized you in water, but you shall be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. Um, and that's verse 5. Therefore, when they had come together, they asked him, saying, Lord, will you at this time restore the kingdom of Israel? Because they're still having this thought that, you know, the Messiah was only here for Israel. You know, the, the, that that's pretty much what Jesus was still here for. So, Jesus, you've done all these things. You've taught us a lot of good teaching. But, you know, there's some truths that we just want to hold on to. We still haven't allowed the Holy Spirit to come in to, and say, you know what, that's not for you, it's not for now. And maybe there's some things in our lives that we're kind of just like them. We're holding on to some things um, that Jesus is saying, no, that's not for you, and it's not for now. Um, and if I work it out, I work it out. If I don't, I don't, but I'm still God. And I think sometimes we need to look at our own lives and just kind of say that as well. Just say, okay, God, you're still God. If you work it out, you work it out. If you don't, you don't. Or if you do it in a way that I won't even be able to really understand it on this side of glory, then that's how you choose to do it because you're God and you probably, I would say 100%, know better than I do anyway because I'm not God and you are. And I'm not going to try to take the place of God and second guess what you're doing, Lord. But he didn't scold them. He didn't scream at them. He didn't bust at them. He just said, it's not for you to know. The times of the seasons which the Father has put in his own authority. Beautiful. Again, a loving Savior, a loving God, a long-suffering Lord. But he reminds them, he's like, no, no, you're, you're kind of getting off on what I'm trying to talk about right now. He says, but, but you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit, because he kind of, he walks into this, you know, you're going to be baptized with the Holy Spirit not too many days from now. And they're like, Lord, are you going to do something amazing in Jerusalem? The guy's like, no, no, it's not for you to understand this, but let me get back on track here. Let me, let me get back on to what I was trying to get across is that you're going to receive power to be witnesses for me. Not for yourself, not for your own personal gain, not for your own personal motives, not for becoming a better individual with these 10 next steps and uh, not how to have a prayer language with these 15 things to do in this during this day. Or No, it's just like the power is going to be on you to be witnesses in Jer Jerusalem to be Judea, Samaria, and all the ends of the earth. A powerful statement. Jerusalem was their hometown. Now, a lot of us have heard this before, but Jerusalem was their hometown. We as the church, we as individuals, cannot neglect our homes. We need to be witnesses in our own personal homes, as well as our neighborhoods, as well as our communities. You know, we have a church here, Rise Church in Chesapeake, Virginia. We need to make sure that we are taking care of Chesapeake, Virginia at the very best we can and not neglecting Chesapeake, Virginia. You know, we're doing some amazing things and we have amazing things planned and we're trying to work through a few things uh, with our school in Kenya and building that. And we are going to continue by the, the, by the grace and the power of God to see that thing through. However, we cannot say, well, Kenya is more important than Chesapeake. Because God's called us here to tend these fields as well. And so we can't neglect them. And too many churches, and I'm not throwing stones at churches, but too many churches have neglected their own personal harvest field to tend other people's. And so we need to make sure that we are tending Chesapeake's. Uh, Judea. Judea would have been a little bit further out there. It would have been a, a little bit harder to get. It would have been you know, a little bit out in the country. Um, you know, If you want to uh, think about around here, we are in Chesapeake and you know, over there in uh, Suffolk. When I think about country, I oftentimes think about 
uh, maybe immigrants, uh, maybe uh, transit workers um, that will be working in the fields here and maybe working in the fields here. How are we trying to minister to people like that on the fringes um, out there? And then he really says something difficult, and it is Samaria. And when you really begin to understand Samaria, not in a poetic way, but in the hard, cruel, gritty way that it was understood then, is that nobody wanted to go to Samaria. Samaritans, remember the woman at the well, uh, Jesus said, I have to go through Samaria. G Jews would journey around to make sure they wouldn't cut through or go into because if you went through there, you would be considered unclean because the people were unclean because they were half Jew and half other things and they didn't worship the same. And even she's like, it's not, even the woman at the well looked at Jesus said, it's not right for you, a Jew, to be talking to me. And then Jesus would so lovingly begin to talk to her and re reveal his uh, truth and reveal himself to her. And she would get so excited that she was an evangelist and went and grabbed all her neighbors and said, there's this man that tells everything about me um, and who I was. But he would remind the church, no, that wasn't just a one-time encounter that I did. Um, something that you're going to have to do a lot. And that's hard. And that's tough. That's really hard ministry. You know, around here, we just uh, got done in February with Love Our Community Month. And we loved our community. We loved um, our first responders. So we gave uh, donuts out to fire departments. We uh, put baskets out there for the police departments. And we went and took um, uh, baskets of goods to the public schools around here as well. And we just had a great time loving our community. But we also went into um, downtown area and uh, ministered at a church, uh, Hope Charitable Service or Sanctuary of Hope. Uh, that is a church of design for the poor and the needy. And we see Samaria represented very well in that church um, and the people there. Uh, we fed them, we loved on them, we prayed with them, we embraced them where they were at because that's what God expects from us. And it's hard and it's difficult. And sometimes it makes us feel very uncomfortable. But God has not called us to be comfortable at all times. And so he expects us to go to Samaria. And then you do all those three things really well. Go to the ends of the earth. Don't forget those as well. And I look at our church, Rise Church, as a church that is, we are trying our, we are trying, and we're succeeding at doing those things. And we want to continue doing those things. Even in this time of hardships and we're kind of having to redo how we do men, ministry temporarily and all those type of things, we still don't want to neglect these areas. We still want to succeed in these areas as well. So let's continue moving forward. Now when he had spoken these things while they watched, he was taken up in a cloud, received him out of their sight. And while they looked steadfastly towards heaven, as he went up, behold, two men stood by them in white apparel, who also said, Men of Galilee, why do you stand gazing up into heaven? This same Jesus, who was taken up from you into heaven, will so come in like manner as you saw him go into heaven. This is a picture of the church right here. And yes, they would have seen, you know, this would, uh, he, he, Jesus was, this is ascension into heaven, and he's talking to him, and he gets down, done with the Great Commission statement, and as he says, and now as he has spoken these things, while they were watching, he was taken up in a cloud and received them out of his sight. There's a lot of theological truths in the cloud of glory and all these type of things in there, and uh, him going up and all these theological truths, but I really love verse 10. Because unfortunately, that is where so much of the church world has gotten. They're stuck. God has said, move forward, and we're stuck holding on to the past, even recent past. And while they had looked steadfastly toward heaven as he went up, they were stuck. They were just gazing. They're like, there he goes, there he goes, there he goes. He's outside. I can't see him anymore. He's gone, he's gone, he's gone. But we're stuck because we're not really quite sure what to do next. Now, he had just received orders. Go to Jerusalem, wait for the Holy Spirit. Not even just moments before. Go to Jerusalem, receive the Holy Spirit, then move forward. Go to Jerusalem, receive the Holy Spirit, and then move forward. They hadn't even budged from the place that they were. Too many churches, we have become stuck because we saw something great. We saw a miracle. God did something unusual. God did something special in our midst. Maybe he did it uh, within our lifetime. Maybe he did it a generation ago. Maybe he did it two generations ago. And we're still holding on and we're hoping that somehow the gospel is going to come back to where we're stuck. But the gospel does not move on stuckness. 
gospel moves forward. The church moves forward. And I'm not saying I'm against tradition or traditional churches. I think there's a lot of things that we can learn from our brothers and sisters that participate and practice in traditional churches as I was a pastor of a traditional church for quite some time myself. But there are too many times where we get stuck in our own traditions. And yes, even some of our churches that we say are non-traditional because we feel like we're so contemporary, well, let's try to play four songs instead of three songs. Then I'll say, well, we don't do that here. Why? Because it's not our tradition. So even our contemporary churches, we kind of still can be very much stuck in our tradition. And I'm not, again, saying tradition is bad. But when we're so beholding and holding on our, tr our tradition that we have become stuck with the gospel, even though Jesus has clearly said, go forward. You know what I love what he does? He never tells them how. He never says, go to Jerusalem, go to Judea, go to Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. Be my witnesses after the power of the Holy Spirit comes upon you. And then, this is the, the, the blueprint I'm going to give you, because this is what I would want. Uh, I, 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 I like knowing steps. I like knowing how I'm going to get to point A to point B. I'm very secure in those things. Jesus never did that for us, because he knew that your ministry in Jerusalem is going to look completely different than it looks in Samaria. And what works in Samaria isn't going to work on the other ends of the earth. It may be different parts of the earth that's going to look very different and sound, maybe even a little bit different as well. And maybe when you mix in cultural context with how also the, the uh, things have changed and uh, things continue moving forward, and maybe things are going to continue changing in the way that we present the untimeless changing gospel of Jesus that Jesus saves and delivers is going to have to change. Just as we're experiencing great change even now, Jesus was never afraid of change. In fact, he embraced change. As we would see the entire early church changing the world upside down. We need to re-embrace this idea of change. We cannot be scared of change. Change is going to happen. Change is going to be real. Change is going to be messy at times. But with the power of God and the power of the Holy Spirit, we can embrace change and as long as we're not changing the message of Christ, we can change the delivery message and how people are receiving that by the power of the Holy Spirit. They were stuck. So stuck that Jesus would have to send essentially angels. Because they're, they're, they, they, uh, two men stood by them white apparel. I mean, come on, messengers of heaven. These are angels. Who also said, men of Galilee, why do you stand gazing up into heaven? Why are you stuck? Why are you stuck at this time? This same Jesus who was taken up from you into heaven will come so in like manner as you saw him going to heaven. Essentially, move forward. Go. It's not time to stay in here. It's time to do the work of the gospel. It's time to do the things that God has instructed you to do. Maybe I'm speaking to somebody right now in their spirit. Maybe God has been speaking to you individually of things that you know that you should be doing, but you're stuck. Because you, maybe you don't know what tomorrow is going to hold. Maybe you don't know what the outcome of all the decisions are going to be. But you've gotten stuck. And fear has gotten you stuck. And I speak to fear right now in the name of Jesus that has no hold on you or your life. In Jesus' name. Move forward with what God's called you to do. Not for you, but for the others out there that will he need to hear your testimony. And what God is doing in your life. Verse 12, then they were returned to Jerusalem for the mount uh, called Olive, which is near Jerusalem on a Sabbath day journey. And when they had entered, they went up into the upper room where they were staying. Peter, James, John, Andrew, Philip, Thomas, Bartholomew, Matthew, James, the son of Alphaeus, and Simon the Zealot, and Judas, the son of James, not the other different Jews. Uh, these all continued with one accord in prayer and supplication with the women and Mary, the mother of Jesus, and with his brothers. I do believe uh, this will be the last time we read Mary's name written in the gospel. Um, but she was there uh, with other uh, women as well in the upper room. It was about a Sabbath day, about a one kilometer journey from where they were. Um, and they give a, a list of some of the people that were up there. Um, we see them. And again, this is a different Judas um, than the Judas that would portray um, Jesus. But they had work to do. They weren't just up there sitting around just saying, okay, well, we're just going to sit here and do nothing. Uh, because again, the gospel has never instructed us to do nothing. 
Uh, the gospel has always instructed us to work. I know. Um, work. Yeah. Ministry equals work. Or work equals ministry. You can't take the two out of each other. Um, in uh, verse 15, in those uh, days, Peter stood up in the midst of the, of the disciples. Altogether, um, there were about 120, and said, Men and brethren, this scripture had to be fulfilled, which the Holy Spirit spoke before the mouth of David concerning Judas, who became a guide to those who arrested Jesus, for he was numbered with us and attained a part of his ministry. Um, and it goes into verse 18 and 19 about how he would um, betray him for um, hang himself, all those things. Um, and then we go into verse 20. For it is written in the book of Psalms, let his dwelling place be desolate and let no one live in it and let another take his office. And so here is Peter. And we've seen Peter before a lot in uh, the Gospels. Uh, we see Peter stepping out of the boat, uh, amazing, and then sinking uh, shortly thereafter. We see Peter uh, having the revelation, uh, you're the son of God. Um, and Jesus was looking at the flesh and blood hasn't revealed this to you. Um, and we see Peter sticking his foot in his mouth. Uh, we see Peter having Jesus look at him and say, your flesh is weak. Your spirit is willing. You can't do what you said you're just going to do. We see Peter denying Jesus three times. We see Peter being restored. We see Peter, but boy, we see Peter now in a leadership opportunity. And he's taking hold of leadership. He's taking hold of the man of God that he's been called to be. Because ultimately, what God saw that Jesus saw when he said, if you follow me, I'll make you fishers of men. And I'll make you, Peter, a fisher of men. I meant that from this day forward, Peter, there's going to be a mark and difference in your life. And we see three plus years later, Peter being the man of God that Jesus saw when he was fishing. If you look past the fisherman garb, if you look past the nets, he looked past the fish, he looked past the boat, and he saw this is somebody that's going to be a carrier of the message. And looking past that, God has that ability to look past who you are today, whatever situation you're going through, and see who you are going to become in the name of Jesus. And Peter stands up and he reminds them and he begins quoting Psalms. And he reminds them, hey, this is actually what David wrote about. We didn't understand it because we didn't have the full knowledge. And we need to, sometimes I think we need to get these guys a little bit of slack because they didn't have the full knowledge. They were learning things as they went. And he said, we, you know, this was actually what David said. He said he's going to, to do all these things. But then he says, we need to have somebody else in his office. And so the church coming together as a church vote. One of the first things they did was had a church vote, a church meeting, a church order. Um, and we see that all through scripture, God is the God of order. He's not the God of chaos. He's not the God of confusion. He's not the God, uh, God of silliness. Um, he is the God of order. And he is the God to be able to come into, if we allow him to, even in our meeting settings, and allow him to be the Holy Spirit and take control of those meetings. I've been in uh, different church meetings over uh, my pastoral uh, ministry career. Um, some have been, man, the Holy Spirit is just resting so hard. There's a group of saints that want to do his work at all costs and just want to lean into him. If that means having to abandon what they deemed as precious, maybe they're in a time, then that's fine. Do it. Holy Spirit, whatever you want, so that people may understand and know that you're God. Amazing, beautiful. I've been in other church meetings that were a little bit different. Uh, didn't have that same attitude. But just because we have a few bad meetings doesn't mean that God isn't the God of order. Just because we have a few bad experiences doesn't mean that God is saying, well, never have a church meeting. Never have this meeting. Never have that meeting. No, he's, he's the God of order. Um, and we see even the early church having to say, hey, let's come together and let's decide on something. And so they would. He says, uh, Therefore, of these men who have accompanied us all the time that the Lord Jesus went in and out among us. So there's the first key. Um, if he, we, we want somebody else to take Judas' spot, who hung himself, um, we need to uh, betray Jesus and all of that. Uh, first off, he needs to have accompanied the Lord the entire time, just like us. Okay. Um, being from the from Bap, the Baptist uh, of John to that day when he would take an approach. They didn't give a timeline. So if you came in kind of late, on the late side, sorry, that's not you. But we want somebody here that from the very beginning when John baptized Jesus, um, from the very time he was taken us up, 
that's who's going to be chosen. So they set guidelines and parameters. And you know what? That means that certain people could not serve. And they were fine with that because the gospel was still going to go forward. Oftentimes we want to be chosen for things. Some of us, out of pride, want to be chosen for things. Some of us, because we think that we should be, um, we, we get that on us and we want those things. But you know, sometimes the Lord says, no, it's just not for you. We have to be fine with that. We have to be fine with the, the, the saying, okay, God, whatever you want me to do, whatever opportunity perhaps I'm given, whatever opportunity I step up to the plate, I'm going to do it for the very best. But if the opportunity does not come, God, you are the, the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords, and you will see things however my calling you see it, you're going to see it done. Was there other people there that thought to themselves, man, I would love to do that? Maybe. Maybe. But at the same time, only one person was chosen. Um, and so then they proposed two people in verse 23. And they proposed two, Joseph and Barnabas, whose sermon was Justice, and Matthews. Um, and they prayed and said, You, O Lord, who knows the hearts of all, show which of these two ha you have chosen, and take part in this ministry and apostleship of which Judas, by transgression, fell, that he might go to his own place. And they cast lots, and lot fell on Matthias. And he was numbered with the 11 apostles. And so here they are. And so what did they do? They prayed. They elected, they proposed two people, Justice and Matthias. And then they prayed. Being there, they said, Lord, you know the hearts of all. And then you show who's going to take part in this ministry. And then they elected Matthias. Now, there's some theologians out there, and some people have speculated, well, they did wrong because, you know, they should have waited for Paul, and Paul would have been the man. And Well, it doesn't say anywhere in the Bible that the Holy Spirit was grieved. It doesn't say anywhere in the Bible that the Holy Spirit said, no, 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 you shouldn't have done this. Um, other people, um, some of our brothers and sisters that would be more on the um, social justice side of things uh, would say, well, they should have elected a woman. Um, some of them would have said other things. But, you know, the reality is they had to do what they felt was best at the time. And we can always look back and say, well, you should have done, but maybe you weren't there. And maybe you didn't have all the information. But it doesn't say anywhere in here and nowhere in the book of Acts that their choice was made the Holy Spirit grieve or God angry or God upset. We never see a time where um, the Holy Spirit comes in and says, you know what? What y'all did there, I was not pleased with. Never recorded. Never shown. Why? Because as ministers of the gospel, we have to continue moving things forward. We're not always going to get it right. Not everyone is always going to celebrate with us. Not everybody's always going to say, hey, you did this right. But that doesn't mean that we sit there and do nothing. Uh, the early church was willing to be bold and say, we're going to take decisive measures. And we're not sure 100%, but we know by the leading of God that um, we're going to move forward with him. And I think as the church... I think that's a beautiful place to, to end today, that there's a lot of things changing. We know that. There we're uncertain about a future and a lot of things, and we're not sure when we're going to be able to meet together right now again. We're not sure when those things are going to be able to happen. But you know, as, as we lean into wisdom and we lean into decision-making, as long as we're leaning into the Lord to help us make those decisions, I think that he's not going to be grieved. He's not going to be upset. And you, as your own personal life, as you are making decisions for yourself and your own family as well, um, lean into the wisdom of God and allow His guidance. There's great advice, and great advice is fine. And there, there's, there's, there's wisdom out there, some godly, some ungodly. But you have to lean in to say, Holy Spirit, help guide me, because that's what they did. They said, Oh Lord, you know the hearts of all. Show which of these two you have chosen. Maybe you're set up with multiple decisions right now. Maybe there's multiple things coming at you. And you just need to look there and just pause, take a breath, and just say, God, what do you want me to do? What is it that your heart is? Because both decisions look pretty good to me right now, God. It doesn't say that they thought one was better than the other. And say that, hey, you know, I think this uh, justice over here, now he stands head and shoulders. They never compared looks, and you'll never see looks compared ever again in the Bible in the New Testament. Interesting fact. 
Um, because again, God looks on the inside, not the outside. The outside was the Old Testament, head and shoulders, strength, hair color, all those other type of things were written throughout many different people within the Old Testament. In the New Testament, you never see that. Why? Because God is concerned with what's in here now rather than out here. And so they had those choices to make. Here's these two choices, God. What do you want us to do? And the Lord led them to this choice. I still believe that God can lead you with your choosing process and the choices he has for you. Um, just don't allow yourself to lead those choices out of fear. Allow yourself to be led with those choices out of love, compassion, and by the power of the Holy Spirit, just as the early church will be. Amen. Let us pray. Father, we thank you for this time, Lord, to be able to spend together. We thank you for your word, Father, that is so rich. And Lord, these words were written and these events happened over 2,000 years ago, Lord. But they're so, still so true to us today in our own lives, Father. We thank you, Lord, for what you're doing, Lord. We give you honor and we give you glory, Lord Jesus. Father, we thank you for the richness of your word, Lord. I pray for the ones hearing this and listening to this, Lord, that you will allow this to become alive unto them, Lord. Allow your word to be alive. Lord, be with them. Give them peace. Help them. We thank you, Father, for who you are. Lord, help us be the ministers that you've called us to be. And we give you praise and we give you honor. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you all. Uh, we hope that you have a wonderful day in the Lord. And don't forget, Sunday we will be meeting on Facebook Live uh, beginning around 10.30 uh, with no technical difficulties, of course. Uh, but we look forward to worshiping together uh, with each other as we can. God bless you all.